Last uh, shear before Hanukkah. Tomorrow the Olam has a trip. And the uh, Siat Deshmaya, we're going to be here, Akiva and I, this Thursday night for the Tish. So very, very excited to share in that type of a space together. We're going to be speaking about tomorrow night miracles in our life. And now so much of our daily life that looks like it's just the natural world. We call Olam Kemin Hagoy Noyeg, that the world is just running like, you know, as if the Creator, God forbid, just turned the, twisted up the watch and it's just kind of clicking. I always need to use a watch muscle. And, but it's not that. Like, oh yeah, the sun just comes up because it comes up. There's a God that's moving everything, which means even natural things are miraculous. Everything's a miracle. Everything is Hashem running the entire world. And on Hanukkah, we start to see that. I just want to read you a little bit, something you've probably heard so many times, but the Gemara is, has infinite depth. So the Gemara says, my Hanukkah. What's Hanukkah? What's Hanukkah? My Hanukkah. What's the nace of Hanukkah? Like Rashi says, Tatana Rabbonim. So the rabbis were learning. So some say that that was already the answer to the question. My Hanukkah, rabbis are learning. That's it. My Hanukkah. Tana Rabbonin. That's what you do on Hanukkah. That's why there's a big thing. Rav Gershon just spoke out. Learn a lot on Hanukkah. Learn a lot on Hanukkah. Learn Hashem's Torah on Hanukkah. Deep, deep, deep. Lots. It's going to be a lot of uh, excitement happening on Hanukkah. A lot of things bring you to this place and to that place. Try to as much as you can learn. Sit. Sit by the candles. Look into the candles. The candles can transport you to another universe. There are many tzaddikim who looked into the candles for eight, nine hours. They just sat by their candles, just meditating into the candles, into the secret, into the message of the candles. The candles are talking. They're not talking like Morgan Friedman voice coming out of Shemaim. They're talking and giving you messages. So sit by your candles, daven, pray to Hashem for every single thing you need in this world. We need so much. And the thing we need the most is you, Hashem, just a relationship. We just need you. When a person has Hashem, he can get through everything. He has everything. A person doesn't have Hashem, but he has all sorts of stuff. He feels so lacking. He feels so lacking. There's a lot of toys out there, you know, a lot of stuff. It's funny, you know, when, when you're a kid, you just want toys. When you get older, we hope that a person matures and they want more refined things than just lollipops and toys. But what's one of the saddest things is when a person gets older and all they want is, a Ferrari. is just bigger toys. But then they feel that those bigger toys are not meeting what they're really looking for. And somehow they still feel lacking, like I'm looking for something, you know, maybe a faster Ferrari, but I don't seem to find it. So you have to get new toys and bigger ones and more fancy ones. But it just leaves this hole of it's not what I'm looking for. And Hanukkah, you look at the smallest candle and there's an awareness, all I was really looking for the whole time was you, Hashem. I'm just looking for you. The Tan Rabon. So we learned Bekof Hei Bekislev on the 25th day of Kislev. Now look at this. Yoy Me Hanukkah. It sounds like all eight days are folded up into the first day of Hanukkah. And the Sfarim do speak this way that on the 25th are the days of Hanukkah. <coughs> Timnaya Inum, eight days. The first day of Hanukkah is very, very powerful. Very, very powerful. We don't say hespedim, we don't say eulogies, we don't fast. And all of a sudden now it picks up on the Hanukkah story. That when the ancient Greeks, they came into the Heichal, they came into the sanctuary right here, Mamish. So what happened? What did they do? Timu kol they took all the pure oils and they made them impure. 
which itself is a very, very powerful thing, is that you could have something that's pure and you could make it impure. We have a concept. We have a concept that this world, that a man is basically created straight, and all of a sudden we start to, we go off. That's called contamination. And we have to come back. We have to purify again. It's like taking a diamond and throwing it into mud. You got to put the diamond back into some, you got to wash it up. When you wash it up, it shines again, it sparkles again. But it gets a bit dirty. It needs to be purified. It has to go into the mikvah. So they came in, the timu kol ashmanim, shebeheichal, all the oil. Now, are we just talking about oil? Is this just physical oil, my friends? What does olive oil always represent in the Kabbalah? It re represents Torah. It specifically represents Chachma. It represents wisdom. Wealth. wealth, also wealth, yes. What's true wealth? Ezu Chacham, Ezu Oshir, Semer Bechelka, a person who's truly a rich person is someone who's, he's wise enough to know that what I have is what I need. He's wise enough to know that if Hashem, is, this is what He gave me, this must be all that I need. The, they came to the Bzusha. You guys heard of Bzusha? It's one of Rabbi Dober's favorite stories. They came to the Bzusha, the Rabbi Bzusha, and they came to the house, and he had nothing, push it, nothing. And barely a table, a chair, just food, it was a bit of water, they put a, maybe a little, a little bit of cabbage, like a single leaf in, and that was the soup. A little bit of flour, that was the soup. And uh, someone came to the house and they said, How do you make the bracha, Sha'asali called Sarki, that God, you have made everything that I need? You have nothing. So he said back to the person, He said, This must be all that I need. This is what I have. I made the bracha. This must be, uh, this, I have what I need. Thank you. This must be all that I need. This just reminded me of another story that I was telling a lot in America when I was there. It's very, very kadai to know this story. Because Hanukkah clues you into this truth. You guys ready for this? The Baal Shem Tov story. There was one time that the Lemberger Rev, Rav, the Lemberger Rav, he was uh, visiting the Tzanzarov. He was visiting the Tzanzarov. And the Tzanzarov, a big, big tzaddik, he came to the house and the Lemberger Rav was there and the Lemberger Rav was like a big, he was big. I mean, he was big and tired, but he was also large and he went to sit on one of the chairs and when he sat on the chair in the Sanzarov's house it Pasha just snapped so he got up he felt very very bad I mean he just broke and there weren't many chairs in the house he got onto another chair and he sat on the chair and sure enough these chairs weren't so fortified they weren't strong and they just that was it chair number two gone at this point, the Tzanzarov noticed that he was a bit nervous, and he went to chair number three, but he saw that he was kind of leaning like this. As if not to put all of his full weight on chair number three, he didn't want to break the Tzanzarov's final chair. So, the Tzanzarov, who was a big tzaddik, he picked up on the nuance of, that somebody was concerned about his wealth, and his, which is very nice. Hashem cares about our wealth, and so should we. We're not wasteful. If the, we're not frugal, but you have to spend, spend intelligently, make intelligent decisions. And every single thing that you spend money on should be for Hashem, should be for God. You should always be able to tell your inner consciousness, this is a purchase that's going to bring more God consciousness into the world. You have to always think about that. So... The Tzanzarov said, let me tell you a story. So he said, now we're in a story inside of a story. So he says, there was a once a big tzaddik in the Baal Shem Tov. He said, yeah, of course, the Baal Shem. So he says, there was a very, very rich gvir, a rich guy that went to go see the great tzaddik, the Baal Shem, the one who began Hasidus. 
the first, the one, the creator of the Hasidic movement. And this rich person was with the Baal Shem. And the rich person noticed that the Baal Shem also didn't have such an elaborate house. And the Baal Shem just picked up on that and he said, I want you to do me a favor. When you're going back on your trip, I want you to go and stop in the house of the Magid from Mezhbij. And you can see that the Hasidim are always going to different places, sending different... He said, go to his house and just, uh, you know, say uh, that I sent you, I say hi. I wanted to pass on my drishat shalom, words of, uh, of love to a dear student of mine. So the rich Gvir, he went on his way back and through Mezhbich. And sure enough, he gets to the house of the maggot, knocks on the door. He feels the entire frame of the house shaking as he's knocking on the door. He gets into the house, he sees the maggot is sitting there on like a bit of a bench type of thing. And all the students are sitting on the floor and he's teaching Torah. And he sees that the maggot has like a, a bit of a barrel, like a rickety look like an old whiskey barrel with a plank on top of it. And that was the table. And that was the entire furniture decor of the house. I don't think uh, uh, my wife would approve if I was to suggest a decor that way. And I don't think many people's wives, and nor should they, approve of that. But that's the way it was. And the maggot did not look up from the teaching. He, uh, the reason I say that is I don't think we're holding at that place anymore. And there's also ways to honor Hashem, like we mentioned, through using your money in, in positive ways and making your home a home <coughs> for Hashem through making it beautiful. As long as you can show that every single thing that you're using for is to make Hashem a home in this world. And it's not just for your honor, but it's for Hashem's honor. So the Maggid did not look up, he was teaching Torah. And then what happened? Shortly thereafter, they had a break. And the Maggid looked up and said, Oh, Shalom Aleichem, welcome. You know, who are you? He said, I'm so and so. I was just visiting the Baal Shem. He told me, to, The Baal Shem Tev. We, you come in the name of the Baal Shem Tev. He said, He told us, Bring a Suda. We're making a Suda. We're having a meal, a festive meal. We have a visitor that came from the Baal Shem. We have to make a meal, a festive meal. And how did they celebrate the festive meal? They took a, a, a shmata that they had around. What's a shmata mean? A shmata. Yiddish words are exactly what they sound like. A shmata, a, a little towel. They took a shmata, usually an old one. Took a shmata, and they put the shmata on the plank that was on top of the rickety barrel, and that was the tablecloth. And then his wife, with great excitement, the Rebbitzin brought out some hot water with a little bit of flour sprinkled into it, and that was the soup. And that was the beginning of the suda. Oh, and some crusty hard bread, like a crouton, a big crouton. And okay, let's wash, having a suda. And the gvir and the rich man started crying. And he said, Oi, I'm so sorry. And the maggot said, why, why, why are you so sorry? And the gavir, the rich man, said, but you know, it, it, there's a mitzvah in the Torah to feel for the pain of, of the impoverished. And, and we should, that is a mitzvah, to feel the pain of those in need. That's why, as religious Jews, we have a responsibility to give tons of money to charity, at least 10% of what we earn, ideally 20%, ideally before you do anything before you take off for profits, just 20%. Speak to your local Orthodox rabbi for more details for your personal situation. You gotta give a lot of money. Give tons of money to charity, people who need. That's how we do that. We give money, tons of money. I know people who give 90% of their money. They have millions of dollars. What do I need? How many millions do you need on a yearly basis? They give tons of money to charity. There's big, big tzaddikim big righteous people in our community, they give tons of money away. It's unbelievable. And their models... Yes, my friend? Do you give before or after tax? So there's a big discussion about that. The question is before or after taxes. Some go so far to say is the second the money comes into your account, you should feel like, I got to get this out. 10%? Right to charity. People in need. Who should you give to, by the way? Aniya Ircha Koidman. 
the halacha is the poor of your local environment come first, and then in concentric circles outwards. You don't save people across the world first, you save the people that are your neighbors. If they're B'nai Torah, even better. Yeah, and if they're B'nai Torah, if they're ones that are, that are Torah scholars, the best, ideally close to you, and then moving away. But everybody, if a person needs help, you give. This is for everybody. We give humanity money. People that need money, we want to support them, we want to help them. I, and we don't believe in this thing, yeah, but they should have earned the money themselves. No. Hashem made it that some people will struggle more, and He gave you the opportunity to help people. The person who's giving the charity should actually feel he has a bigger merit. He's like getting better on the deal. It's a funny thing, you're like, what do you mean? Isn't he making more on the deal? He's getting the money. No, but he's helping me to give away my money. You know who you become like? Hashem. Hashem gives everything. Hashem's the biggest giver. You, the poor person's helping you be like God. So we're mega. We're fanatics for charity. We're fanatics for acts of kindness, of giving. Okay, back to our story. So the maggot said, I'm crying because I'm feeling that there's so much, there's so much impoverishedness here. So... You have nothing in your house. So listen to this, my friends. I'm mamish. I'm, this story hits me in such a deep place. Like they say nowadays, it hits. It hits different. It hits diff. It's so, this hits. Everyone's laughing because it's true. <laughs> so just, you ready? So the maggot said, maybe you'll tell me what you have in your house. So the rich man started to say, I have bookshelves, I have, I have tables, I have chairs, nice ones. I have armrests, mahogany, mamish, gewaldic. I have oak, I have... Yeah, what else? Tell me more. What else do you have? I have, I have gorgeous curtains, and I have, you know, made out of fine silks from around the world, and, and I, bring, I bring scholars to my home, and I, I have... Yeah, yeah, what else? What else do you have in your house? And, uh, we also have, I have a lot of jewelry and my wife. That I, we have lots of, uh, what, what else? Oh, and then we, we do. We have cor- carriages and horses. And yeah, yeah, tell me, you know, what else do you have? And then we have, like, the, you know, the, the pool houses and back houses. And we have, we have, you know, we have rare antique items and gold and silver and, and pearls. We have, we have lots of stuff. And nowadays a person might say, I have a HD, my the liquid screen and my Xbox. I got all my stuff, I got tons of stuff. My Ferrari, my Tesla, Posh it. I got a lot of stuff in the house. Oh yeah? So the maggot said, but I, I noticed, you, but, you know, you don't have any here. Like, like where is it all? Like, oh, he's like, it's, it's in my house. I, I don't have it with me now. I'm just traveling. It's, it's all in the house. But, you know, I'm traveling. So said the Maggid, I'm also just traveling. I'm traveling through this world. You know where my real house is? Up in heaven. My real house. Oh, you know what I have in my house house? All my mitzvahs. All the Torah. You know what I have in my house? I'm also traveling. So you see, I'm, I'm traveling light in this world. Crazy. It's crazy stuff, right? And it always reminds me of a story. There was a big tzaddik that he had two hats. He had a very, very fancy hat. And he had a, a kind of a weekday. The fancy hat he would wear to chasanas, weddings, simchas, big events. And the poshet hat he would uh, wear. And the person, a poor man came to the house and he said, I need a hat. Okay. He went to the back and he gave this poor man his very fancy celebration hat. So some of the chassidim, they said to the Rebbe, they said, you know, Rebbe, maybe you should have given him like the, you know, the weekday, like the less, you know, you should have held on to the, the fancy one, like the nice one. He said, I did hold on to the nice one. Up there. I mamish held on to it. Forever. Forever mamish. Everything we're talking about now, this whole lens is purity seeing the world through pure eyes. This is the world of what we just said, of what oil means. 
Oil, we said, is chachma. Oil, we said, is who is the rich man? The one who's happy with what he has. And you know, there's another way to understand that. Ezu ashir, samer bechelkoi. So we usually means it's happy with, with what I have. With my chalik, with what, you know, what Hashem gave me. Like Reb Zusha, this must be all that I need. Because this is what Hashem gave me. To work with in this world. It doesn't mean that you don't have aspirations. But you're happy every step of the way. There's another way to understand the Mishnah. Ezu asher, who's the rich man? Samer bechelko. He's happy with someone else's lot. When somebody else gets a good shidduch, he dances for that person. When somebody else makes a big business deal, he dances for that person. I'm so happy for you, bro. When somebody else is financially doing well, he's happy for that other person. Then you're rich. And you can be happy with somebody else's success. Because we're all one. We're mamish all one. <coughs> you think the foot is not happy when the arm is uh, feeling better? Of course, your whole body's feeling better. It's not like you're, you know, this arm is good, so like whatever on the other arm, who cares? Like your whole being doesn't feel good when one part is not feeling good. When, when every part of you is feeling good, every part feels good. This is the pure oil. And the ancient Greeks wanted to defile that. And they said when you're sitting by the Hanukkah candles, whatever you do, don't think about pure things. I'll tell you something crazy. When the Greeks said that we're not allowed to learn Torah, I have a proof that they actually didn't mean that fully. We think, what did the Greeks do? They took away Shabbos, they took away Torah, what else did they take away? Brismila and Rosh Chodesh. What do you mean, they took away Torah? Oh yeah, right, everyone knows, like the dreidels. When they came in, we closed our Gemaras, and we're like, oh, we're just playing dreidel here. They actually didn't mind that we learned Torah. They wanted the Torah translated into Greek. They thought the Torah was an amazing masterpiece. You know what they rejected? The Shemin of Torah. The wisdom of Torah. They rejected the fact that God was in the Torah. They rejected the fact that we should think in deep godly ways. They rejected the fact of thinking about how can I use my money to help somebody else. How can I be a wise person in this world? And a wise person knows that Hashem runs the whole world. They reject it. Don't live with Hashem. You can have Shabbos. Everybody needs a day off, right? So you know what? We don't call Shabbos a day off. Everton Weinberg, she should live and be well and strong. She famously made these magnets. Shabbos is not a day off. It's a day on. It's a day on. It's a day where you're so turned on to God. Hanukkah is the time that we become turned on to God. And the Greeks wanted to make everything dark. They wanted to take, they said, go through the motions of life. Just don't feel, don't have that deep wisdom. They wanted to make it all into secular wisdom, which we just call secular information. We wanted to make God a living, breathing part of our life. That's what we're into. So, Bezrat Hashem, this Hanukkah, sit by the candles, meditate into the candles. Think about God in your life. There's, we're going to see there's no nature. It's all God. God is running everything. Hashem is with us. And when a person lives like that, he knows, I'm just passing through this world. <coughs> everything that I'm going to do in this world should just be to bring Hashem into this world. No more, but no less. Everything that I'm using in this world, Hashem, it's for you. But I'm realizing this world is just a, a stop along the train line. Because the real world that we're going to is the palace is the world to come. On Hanukkah, the, the lies of this world, the darkness of this world, goes away. It just takes one candle. All you have to light on Hanukkah is one candle. You don't even need to light more. Just one candle to remind you what life is all about, a relationship with Hashem. And we should be zeich to that mash, and the shit that came from here, Amen. Amen. Afrei lechem Hanukkah, Rabbi Yisrael. Lechem Hanukkah. Kol Tuf.